I've been working with a lot of students lately and what I'm finding for students who are complete beginners to about a thousand USCF in rating, we're having a problem with a bit of too much overgeneralization and openings. It's very rare you can use a one size fits all approach and in none of those cases is it going to be completely perfect. We do have in the playlist on the channel when I've shown structural orientation. You can play structures, but like I said, in not all situations it's going to be perfect. We're going to see in the following one minute game, and I'm showing a one minute game for practical purposes and instructional purposes. If you have studied your openings enough, you've trained, you've drilled them enough, you don't have to think it's reactionary. You know. That's when you know you've trained a line enough is as you're playing it, you're, you look forward to seeing a certain move or idea and certain glimmers or flashes of games pop into your mind. So let's go ahead and go through and I am playing white in this game and we get a Catalan. Now, if D4 is played. So C6 this early this is going to more than likely transpose into a closed Catalan with if bishop e7 takes place. Well, in this case, bishop e7 did not take place. Bishop d6 did. And when a person has learned, let's say, the diamond structure, the slob structure, it's often a question of where should the bishop go, bishop e7 or bishop d6. And often when playing the slob, the more aggressive move is to play bishop d6, but you can't overgeneralize because the reason not to play bishop d6 is either a devastating pin or your opponent is going to be able to play e4 and potentially e5 at some point. Now, that is what the issue is with bishop d6 here. So notice immediately I start going into prep mode, knight f to d2. Now, the one knight is not going to be enough if it was white's move again and I play e4. We're just going to be trading a whole bunch. And my bishop, he's eventually going to get kicked back. And all I did was trade and release tension. You need to build tension with a point. So after castles, knight c3. Very, very important. Because now black has this defensive structure and all he can really do is wait. e4. I'm threatening e5 with the fork. So now he's got to relinquish the center, and on top of that, in order to maintain the bishop pair, he's going to have to waste a tempo on the bishop. Now, that's where my opening preparation really ends. But I remember seeing an article on the U.S. Open that was in California in 2022, and the following game stuck out because it was almost point blank what I had in prepared for this particular line in my Master of the English opening course for Chessable. Bishop e7 was played, and this is the most popular move in the database, and white is doing very well statistically. Bishop f4, you're eyeing the d6 square, very natural. Knight c3. Now bishop d6 is played. And this is from one of my uh, fellow instructors at the Emory Castle Chess Camp and friend, Grandmaster Daniel Naroditsky. And this next move, if you're a pause your video to find the correct plan or idea type of person, now's the time to pause and figure out what would you do in this position for white and why. Well, much like in the French defense and many of these slob type variations, the bishop on c8 is terrible, completely locked out of the game. So black would love to get that bishop active. And with this move, rook e8, you're telegraphing the punch to eventually play e5. I really love this move, bishop e5. It says, please, would you like to capture here and be guaranteed to just suffer? I mean, you can trade, too, to make it even worse if you'd like, because I'm going to get this monstrous pawn structure. And you know what? That is a beautiful square for a knight to go into. This is the definition of suffering. Don't do this to yourself. Queen c7 was played in that game and maintain control over that square. Excellent play. 
by GM Narditsky, and things get liquidated. Notice how all the white pieces are coordinated for an attack on the king side, whereas all the heavy pieces for black are just kind of on the board. Nothing critical. And rook g4, threatening to capture. Queen takes h6. Now for another pause the video type moment, what would you do with white here? Well, we're going to force it through. Rook f6, exclaim. Very nice idea, which finishes the game quite swiftly. And black resigned. Now, that was... My notes in a good example game. So let's see my one minute game. My opponent played bishop c7, which isn't nearly as popular as bishop e7 seen in the Narditsky game. Now we got bishop g5. Forcing and good. I say, please, would you like to go ahead and weaken your pawn structure further? Oh, you would. Okay. Well, I'm going to go to the square I wanted to to start with, but I was just going to test and see if I could make you make some sort of concession. Right, Black is still telegraphing. He wants to play for e5. Sure, go ahead. Play for e5. Because now I have d5. And with it comes the threat of d6. So capture, capture. Now, I'm not in any hurry. I know I've got a big edge here, and Black is suffering to just complete development. So let's optimize all the pieces and overwhelm the opponent. Rook f d1. Not a problem. You're able to get rid of one guy, but I'm making sure that the knight can't easily get out. The bishop can't easily get out. The rook can't easily get out. Keep your opponent's pieces inactive. Knight b6. Sure. Now, here is a good moment. Now, keep in mind it's a one-minute game, and this is typical for me, especially in fast time controls, that when I have a position where I'm in complete control, I just look to slowly improve. That's it. I don't take any risk, and I miss tactical flourishes. So the engine likes d7 here with the idea of knight d6. Forcing matters. Of course it does. So now that we know the most forcing move, what do you think I did and why? Okay? So I said slow improvement, right? A4. Say, all right, you can't play a5. I'm going to kick your knight to a worse square. What are you going to do? This is how, again, in our, I believe, most recent video, I talked about the concept of engine play versus human play in these types of positions. Engine always finds the most direct, tactically-based route. Humans will play moves that improve the position and take no risk if they play this style of play. So bishop d7, I continue with my plan. Now queen b3, queen was attacked, so I put the queen on a square to build tension, hit the b-pawn, and have this x-ray. And my opponent played knight d6. So what's best for white here? What would you do? All right, give that 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Trade down. And that's the end of the game. And that's the end of this video. Don't get caught up too much in structural orientation. Try to understand the exceptions. In my books on chessable concerning openings, I use the term memory marker quite a lot. And for me, in my personal notes, when I see bishop d6, it is a memory marker for me to play knight d2, knight c3, and slam in the center with e4, because I know I'm going to be gaining time off my opponent, and he's going to be relinquishing the center. This particular line is not good for black. Memory marker. What defines the position for you? Study it. Get it down. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Thanks.